creator of the universe, he made this world to function and to operate and to cycle, be cyclical, round and round. Everything revolves around something else. Everything uh, is connected to something else. And there is a system that he put in place, and it's called seasons. And just an odd thing that he said to me about this, not an odd thing, but it was just odd the way that he dealt with me over this. But I want to I wanna kind of compare seasons, if I can, to rooms in a house. I know that's kind of odd, too. So let's pray before we get started. So hopefully I'll make sense. Father, I praise you for your word. I thank you for your peace that is overwhelming this morning. I ask for us to hear you today, not me. And Lord, help us to realize that when you speak, seasons change. I pray your blessing on the kids, the kids' church back there, the teachers, the leaders, the nursery. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you from the depths of my being for speaking to us. If you agree with me, say amen. Seasons, four seasons in <clears throat> our system, in the world. It's, we have spring, summer fall and winter. Seasons are like rooms in a house. Each room is different. I know nowadays that because of our technology, because of our affluency in America, we are one of the most blessed, we are the most blessed nation in the world um, in all points. But because we have prospered so much and because we have the ability, the opportunity, the equipment, the technology, um, everything that we have in the world, how many know even our houses have developed far beyond what they used to be? Most houses basically had four areas in them from way back until we started really making them fancy. Only the people that had a lot of money had a big fancy house and began to add way more rooms. Stay with me. They, they, when, when, when they had more room, they had more money and they had more ability, they added more rooms or more places in that house to do more things or sometimes they were just rooms that weren't even really that necessary but we, uh, they thought it would be neat to say, I have this room that's just for this or I have this room for this. But basically, there's, there's, there's four rooms or four places in houses. Not all houses are built the same but all serve or were planned to serve the same purpose. Amen? The Bible says that you and I are the temple. You and I are the house that God dwells in. Amen? He no longer dwells in buildings. He's not just in this building. He's not just in the church down the street. He just, doesn't just inhabit a certain place in a certain time that that's the only place He inhabits. God inhabits His people. Amen? And so I want to I go slowly into this this morning because this is a thought that he, he's, he's laid on me that I probably haven't taught on here before or haven't uh, uh, dove into very deep before. But, and I'll try to, try to not make it laborious for you this morning. But you are the temple, you are the house. And I begin to hear the, the words of Jesus when he, when he made this statement, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you so. And I go there to prepare a place that you and I may dwell together. How many know before Jesus was resurrected, He didn't dwell in everybody? God's Spirit did not dwell in everybody. God's Spirit could not dwell in mankind the way it would after Jesus. And Jesus said that in my Father's house, where's the Father's house? In us are many dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would have told you so. Jesus knew that he was about to die and that he was about to become the sacrifice for all of humanity. And he was about to make a, an, a way for the Spirit of God to dwell in among everybody. 
He said, I go there. Where? To the house. My father's house. To prepare. We've always been taught that is heaven someday. It's over yonder. God's going to build me a great big mansion. And I'm going to have a big screen TV. And I'm going to have all this kind of stuff. And I began to just ask simple questions like, all right, who are we going to watch on TV? Because if we're all in heaven, I don't want to have to play football for you. You wouldn't want to watch me play football on your big screen in heaven anyway. Amen. But if we're going to, if it's all about this house and this mansion over yonder, who's going to be the plumber? Well, <laughs> I'm just asking some simple stuff. I'm trying to get you to think with me this morning. If it's all about a house someday over yonder, do I believe in heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. So don't get scared. All right. But if it's about God building us a mansion, just build my mansion over the hilltop. And then you had the poverty-minded people that would say, just build me a cabin next door to Jesus. And we made a song out of that. The people that just barely squeaking in, if I could just have a little spot over in the corner of heaven somewhere. They're really just a sacred, i got to not be mean this morning. They're just almost a country song, some of them, that we used to sing in church. Amen? But it just doesn't fit the picture for some reason with me of this overcoming, all-conquering God if we just barely squeaked in. Amen? I, he, I, to me, He's a conquering God. He's the God that takes over. He's the God that controls it all. If He spoke it all into being, He said, As surely as I live, saith God, all the earth will be filled with my glory, my purpose. That word really means purpose. With my purpose, I'm going to fill this whole thing. The Bible says, uh, i got to not go there yet. Hang on. Fix up, uh, 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 prepare. He said, I go there to prepare. This is 2,000 years ago. Jesus makes this statement. He said, I'm going there to prepare a place. Do you realize that before Jesus, there was no opportunity for heaven? Because there's none righteous, no, not even one. No one could keep the law. No one could do it right. No one could be good enough to get there. That's why when Jesus died, he had to go down into hell, your Bible says, and preach to those who were sometimes disobedient. And your Bible says that after the resurrection, that Old Testament saints come up out of graves and were seen walking the streets of Jerusalem that day. That is in your Bible. That's resurrection power, amen? That doesn't sound like squeaking in to me. That sounds like anybody connected to him, anybody that heard what he said when he went down into hell and he preached and he took captivity captive, the Bible says, and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and I can't find in the rest of the book where he gave them back. He set the captives free and out of the prison house. I used to sing a song when I was a little boy. It's called Little Boy from the Carpenter Shop. Dwayne Friend wrote it. And... And, and I love that song. And it says in that one place in the song, out of the prison house came a procession led by the king. Another place in the song, it says that he shook hell's gates and he cried, lift up your heads. The king is coming through. I used to, I couldn't hardly contain myself when I was a little old boy singing that song. I, I just couldn't wait to get to that part of the song. Because it was the victorious part. Amen? It was the part that he won. He took it over. He, he emptied hell out that day. He preached the good news of the gospel to them that I'm here. I have now come. I am here to break this thing. I am here to break a cur every curse. Every curse is on me. I am here to be the, 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 the sacrifice for all humanity. He said before he left, if I go to prepare it, anybody ever fix up a room in your house? You get ready to have a baby, you fix up a room. Amen. You prepare. You fix it up for a special occasion. That means that you got it all ready before the guests arrive. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you where you and I can dwell together. Everybody say together, please. I'm here to talk to you today about season's greetings. You say that doesn't sound much like season's greetings yet. I'll get there. I was thinking about how that most times when God speaks... It becomes a new season. If you, uh, as I read through Scripture, and, I, and when I'm reading through Scripture, I find all through Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, that most of the time when God spoke, the season changed. Doesn't that make sense? This is the same God that spoke, let there be light, and poof, light came, and darkness 
was expelled. He said, let there be a division between the dry land and the water, and, and, and earth and water began to separate, and we had seas and dry land. He just spoke everything God spoke Something moved, something changed. It, it is God that changes the seasons. It is God that allows the seasons. It is God that controls it all. I read through the scripture and I found out, the more I read, even in the Old Testament, that God didn't talk near as much as some people claim he talks today. I'm not trying to be mean. I believe that he is with us. I believe that he wants to speak to you and I. But all through scripture, when I look at the patriarchs of faith like Abraham, God would speak and we have no record that he spoke again for years. And we are in a society today and Christian, Christendom today or, or some Christians today can't make it if they don't have somebody speak to them or, or think God spoke to them every day or at least every other day or, or can't make it through a week. I think what if God only spoke once every 20 years? Would we hang on to that? Would we hold to that? Would we know that he spoke, seasons change, I'm in this season till he speaks again? Amen? <laughs> you guys are looking at me funny. Hang on, we'll get around there in a minute. But I'm, I'm not saying that he doesn't still speak by any means today. I do believe that he does speak, but I don't think he speaks as often as we'd like him to. Can we just be honest? I'd like him to speak to me every day. I'd like to get up every morning and say, God, what am I supposed to do today? And just have him give me a list, and I'd just do the list. I wouldn't have to think. I could just do it. Amen? That'd be nice. But it doesn't work that way. Why? Because he is in us. He wants to work through us. Amen? He, he, I can't go into that yet either. <clears throat> and it's okay if he doesn't speak to us as often as we want. In Scripture, when God would speak, it appears that whatever season that person or that nation even was in would be greatly affected or changed by God's Word. Do you believe that God's Word changes seasons? If you don't, I hope I can convince you of it before the end of the day today. Do you believe that God's Word changes seasons? Even Joshua, where we have been the last few weeks in our study, Joshua runs in, can you pull up Joshua chapter 5 for me? Joshua runs into a man right before he goes to take Jericho. Jessica has been in a mode or a season, if you will, and obviously is ready and willing to fight. Have you ever been around somebody that's just looking for a fight? That they're just on edge, and they're just any little, any little something, they just, they're ready to fight. So, oh yeah, you want some? You want some of this? They're just, it's like, calm down. Not everybody's ready to fight. Why are you laughing? Yvonne said him. No. But they're just that way. And Joshua, Joshua has been this, this, of this other generation that made it through the wilderness. We've been talking about this lately. And he, he comes through the wilderness and God has spoke to him. They've crossed the river. He said, circumcise them again. I mean, this dude is ready to go. He's ready to take this promised land that God has told him he could have. And I just think the guy might have had just a little testosterone flowing. Little more than normal because he can see Jericho, the Bible says, and he's jacked up because God already told him that's yours. Anybody ever have somebody tell you something that was yours that you'd wanted for a long time and you couldn't get the wrapper off of it? We're right into Christmas where we get, we asked, when we were kids, we asked for presents. And I don't know if you're like me, I would just be sitting there holding the present and we, we could touch them a little bit, but we weren't supposed to pick them up. And we'd, me and my brother would be standing there sometimes and we'd accidentally fall and, oh, stuck my finger through the paper <laughs> on that soft spot, you know, where the truck was in the box and it had that soft spot, but, you know. Because you just couldn't wait. I just wanted it so bad because I knew it's going to get it. But it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and he looked. And behold, a man stood opposite of him with his sword drawn in his hand. Now that would make you a little, want to fight, I mean, a little concerned about whether or not you're going to fight if a guy's standing with a sword in his hand. Amen? And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or are for our adversaries? And so he said, No. But as a commander... Of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Everybody say, now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he worshipped. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot. For the place where you stand is holy. 
and Joshua did so. Doesn't that sound a lot like what God said to Moses? Didn't we learn just in the last week or two that God told Joshua, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. Amen. And it's amazing to me that the, the, the commander uh, for, for the heavenly host is standing there with a sword, sword drawn. And he says, as soon as Joshua realizes who's there, he falls to his face and he worships. And he says, what does God say to me? And he says, take your shoe off your own holy ground. When God speaks, seasons change. Amen? When God speaks, seasons change. I'm going to skip past some stuff here for the sake of time. But I love how he says it, neither. I'm not for you or for them. I am now come. What a greeting. In other words, the season is changing because I'm here. I don't know about you, but I can be in one of the worst times of my life, or worst situations of my life, especially when I was a kid. And you might be in trouble, or you may be in a place that you couldn't get out of, or you may be scared or whatever, but I had the privilege of having a, a father that I knew that if he got there, he's going to be all right. Amen? If I could just get him there with me, if I could just get him with me if i could just get somebody with me i would be all right it works the same way with me today about about the lord even no matter what i'm going through in my life if i can hear god speak if his presence just i can realize his presence in the room it doesn't matter i'll fart off <laughs> oh, hopefully i don't do that church dismissed I'll fight a grizzly bear with a stick. <laughs> I hate Facebook Live. <laughs> with a passion right now. Whew, help me, Jesus. <laughs> Do what? <laughs> it's true. We don't have time to go through all the seasons greetings in scriptures, if you will. The examples of where God speaks and seasons change. But if you'll just think back with me through scripture, every time God would show up and speak, everything began to change. God spoke in the beginning, everything into existence. And no matter what the situation was, back in the Old Testament, you had kings and prophets. When the prophet came, how many know he was carrying the word of God? And when God spoke, they had a choice. You could either get in with what God was doing or you could get out of the way because it wasn't going to be good. Amen? Not that God was mean, it's just God had made a decision. If God has made a decision, how many know it's over? When God's already decided something, if God's already planned to do something, Proverbs says, many are the plans of a man's heart, but it's God's will that prevails. Amen? How many is thankful that God's will prevailed sometimes in your life when you didn't think it was a good idea? How many have prayed prayers and God didn't answer them? And then a little later you, you thanked Him because He didn't answer them. Amen. I'm not talking about just the Garth Brooks song. I'm talking about all the other times in our life where we're thankful that God didn't answer our prayers. We're thankful that it didn't go the way we thought it should be. And we're thankful that we had a God that knew better. And when he spoke, by golly, that's what happened. Amen. So we don't have time to go through all these. But when God speaks, seasons change. We are now in the holiday seasons. We're actually Christmas season. How many know this season is different? It's a different time of year. You can feel it. Can anybody feel the difference when you get into the holiday seasons after Thanksgiving? Not just because you overate on Thanksgiving, but you can feel it. Not, and not just because it's Black Friday and everybody wants to kill each other that morning. But the seasons change. It's like everybody's in a better mood. Everybody's, everybody's happy and happy holidays or Merry Christmas. Or, or they just we're thinking about buying gifts for people. That's a good thing for some of you and a sad thing for some of you. I can see the look on your faces. It's like, yeah, I know. But it just changes this season. It's like everybody gets in a better mood for some reason. You think, well, duh, it's about Jesus. Amen. And presents. We like presents. But people are shopping. They're preparing for the season in a big day when we all get together to spend time together. 
We're celebrating, I don't know about you, but our family has made the decision we're done buying presents. Christmas is not about buying presents for us anymore. If you do that, that's fine. God bless you with that. We've done it for years and years and years. But Christmas is not about buying presents anymore. Christmas is about Jesus. Christmas is about celebrating the season or the time when God came to earth. And the biggest thing that we want to do is to be able to be together and spend time together and spend time with our family. Amen? But we're celebrating this time of year of the Lord's birth. I really felt impressed of the Lord to remind us of a few things today. Every season is like rooms in a house and there are four main seasons. There are really four main places in a house for the most part. And please let me generalize this a little bit for you this morning. Don't get all legalistic on me and say well yeah you forgot the broom closet or something like that all right or the pantry or stuff like that but basically even in Jesus's day the houses didn't have rooms in them they were basically a one room building and everybody was in the same room and everybody slept together in the same place they would lay a pallet on the floor and they would sleep there together snuggled up together because it, they could keep warm that way if there was any cooking going on it wasn't even necessarily in the houses in that day but as 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 time progressed and we begin to develop and and become more modern we begin to put uh, more rooms and things but just for a few minutes, I just want to go over this for, uh, briefly this morning. There are really four main places or rooms in most houses. Number one, the entry or the foyer. It's where you first walk into the house. It's the beginning where you just get inside. You're not all in, but you're out of the weather. Where you meet people, where you introduce yourself. This is who I am. Now, who are you, basically? If you're meeting and greeting people, it's, it's that... It's that it's that when we first meet level, I don't know about you, but how many know that first impressions can be very effectual? I didn't say affects, I said effectually. The first impressions go a long ways, amen? Even in churches, the statistic is proven that people decide, even uh, Tom James did a, a study on it and said within the first 10 minutes, but I read some more stuff even more recently than that that said they decide even in the first five minutes if they come into a church whether or not they're going to come back. How many know that's first impression? That's entry. That's what we have these, these entry places in our houses, in our life. Then we have kitchen and dining where you prepare food or you eat the food. It gets hot in the kitchen. Amen? <laughs> Have many ever heard the phrase, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen? That's the place in our life. That's the place in us where God begins to cook stuff and he's, he's beginning to deal with us. And I don't have time to go into these in depth like I want to this morning, but he's beginning to cook things. He's beginning to, to do things that are going to feed you. It might be hard. It might be hot at times, but it's things that we need. How many know that when you go through seasons in your life, even the ones that you didn't like or that were hard, you can look back later and realize if I had not gone through that, I wouldn't have the understanding I have now. If it was just easy peasy all the time, I wouldn't have the knowledge, I wouldn't have the wisdom, I wouldn't have the experience that I have now. You can have a lot of knowledge, but if you don't have the experience, how many know it's not as effective? When, when you've had the effects of a situation, when you've had the pain of a situation, or you've had the struggle of a situation, how many know that you appreciate when it's not there, when it's good? You appreciate getting out of that. You appreciate when it does get easier or better. So every season has a purpose and a time and a reason. You prepared food, then you sat down together. And you ate the food together. And you had conversations together. One of the most statistics, I heard a statistic last night that families spend, this is, this was last night. Families spend 37 and a half minutes a day on average together. 24 hours and we spend 37 and a half minutes together. How many remember sitting down when we all ate together? Well, times have changed only because we let them. Only because we stopped. Well, we used to be able to sit down, and we can't because our kids are on their phone. Take the phone. Boy, that went over like a pregnant high jumper. Well, it's just not that way anymore, Pastor. It's because you let it change. 
Because I let it change. Well, things are just, you know, Christmas is just commercialized now. It doesn't have to be in my house. They can beat each other over the head at Walmart in the middle of the night over a stupid TV all they want. I'm sleeping. Amen? Just because somebody else is stupid doesn't mean you have to be. Just because somebody else does something or society is doing something doesn't mean you have to be. You can still stand up like Joshua and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to have relationship. As for me and my house, I am your parents. As for me and my house, I do know what's best for you because I'm older than you and because God gave you to me. You're his gift to me. So until you want to leave the house, you need to do what I say. Come on, parents, help me. That's when we used to have a structure. That's when we used to have a system that worked. Amen? Didn't mean to go there when we sat down and ate. I remember sitting down at the table. You couldn't sit down at the table and and not discuss what was going on. You couldn't sit down at our table and have an attitude. If you did, you just smiled through it and kept eating. (laughs) Eating. Where'd that come from? Man, it's a bad day for me. I remember one time, some of you have been here a long time, may have heard me tell this, but I was in school in this, I was like fourth grade, one of these bigger kids, our lunch, lunch uh, times, we, we, we were going to, back to the grade school, and the junior high or the high school kids were going back to the high school, and we passed each other outside between buildings. And there was this uh, high school kid that didn't like my brother too well, and so he decided he'd take it out on me. And so he just caught me and picked me up and grabbed me and by the arms and began to swing me around and then he just threw me across the yard, across the playground and I skinned my face up a little bit and skinned my hands up and stuff and didn't say anything because he was like way bigger than me, there was no need to fight and just went home, didn't say a thing, <coughs> was sitting at the table that night <laughs> because we all sat at the table together and we ate together, and we talked together, and whatever was going on became a family situation, and we all prayed together, and we would deal with stuff together, and if we had something to solve, we could solve it together, because how many know together you can do a whole lot more than apart? Oldest trick in the book is divide and conquer. Don't let the enemy divide your family. Don't let the enemy divide your house. Don't let the enemy divide anything. Be stronger than that. Step up and say, no, we're going to do it this way. Because that's the way that God designed it. That's the way he planned it to work, and that's the way it works the best. You can fight a season all you want and say, I'm going to stand out here in my bathing suit because I want to get a tan, and when it's 10 degrees and the wind's blowing, who's the one that's going to look stupid? If God says the seasons are changed or God plans something to go a certain way, you can do it outside of God's plan or not go with what God said, but you're the one that's going to pay for it. I'm the one that's going to pay for it. My brother looks over at him and he said, what's, what's up on your face? I said, nothing. I fell. And because we were together, and because we knew each other, and because we could sense when something was wrong with somebody, he said, no, what's really the deal? I said, it's no big deal. I fell today. It's cool. He said, no, you didn't. I used to hate that. Any kids in here hate it when your parents know you're lying? Or even family members, it's like you can't even lie to them because... <laughs> Look at the mean faces everybody's making. (laughs) I said, it's no big deal. He said, no, what really happened? I said, nothing. He said, tell me what happened. Then I'm thinking, well, I'm going to get it again. (laughs) I said, well, so-and-so threw me on the ground today. He said, did you smart off to him? (laughs) Where would he come up with that? (laughs) I said, no. He said, you didn't do anything. I said, no. He said, okay. I thought that was it. Till the next day, I heard what happened to him. <laughs> Why? Because my brother was there. Because I had support with me, because he was there, because he cared, and because we are a family, and because that guy never touched me ever again. Matter of fact, he got away from me when I got anywhere close to him when we passed each other. Amen? God is that way with you and I. God wants to protect us. He wants to help us. He wants to be there with us. Each room, then we had um, the next statistics I heard uh, last night also was, or I looked up last night, most parents spend less than two minutes a day of undivided attention with their children. Two minutes, and we blame the school. 
Two minutes and we blame the church because they're not teaching our kids. Two minutes. Undivided attention. I'm not talking about just brushing by or on the way to school when they're on their phone and you're on your phone and you're hauling them to school and say, well, it took me 30 minutes to get to school or 15 minutes. No, that's not undivided attention. I'm talking about undivided attention. I'm tired of seeing these posts griping about preachers watering down messages. It's not us watering down the messages near as much as y'all not spending time with what you need to spend time with. It's not our job to raise your children. It's your job to raise your children and he'd have gave them to me. Amen? It's time we start owning some stuff. I love it because this is coming alive in America today. We're going to own our situations. We're going to deal with the situations and quit being the manby pamby panty waste people blaming everybody else for the problem and you fix it. You stay home with your kids. You spend time with your family. You do what's necessary. Why? Because you need to be there together. Amen? And you say, well, I'm not that statistic. Good. Thank you. You're a world changer. I mean that with all sincerity. I thank you parents that have taken the time or some of you moms that stay home with your kids and say, we'll take less money, but we're going to stick with the kids. We don't have to have quite as much stuff, but we're going to spend time with the kids. Some of you grandparents taking on kids that, that weren't even your kids, but you're taking them. You are changing the world when you do that. You are changing generations when you spend that time. You are changing generations. I just had this discussion with somebody this week. Uh, it's one of my favorite quotes from Lynn. If you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Go home and take care of your family, Dad. If you really want your kids to be successful, go spend time with them. Amen? The living room. That's where you live. Together. Together. That's where you spend time and do life for the most part together. That's where you entertain guests together. That's where you have Christmas together. It's the living room. It's the life. It's the time in your life when you're living. Each room in the house was like a different season, but it was a place to gather together. So life together. Live life together. Share good times and bad times Together, we are a body of Christ. You and I individually are the house of God or the individual's body or houses of God, but we are corporately together the body of Christ, and we need to be together. In Jesus' day, when you went to someone's house, it meant something. People are starving for relationship today. When you went to someone's house, it meant something. That's why people would get so upset. What, basically what it meant, if you went and shared a meal with somebody, it basically meant that you uh, condoned their lifestyle or that you were friends with them or that you, you were trying to be friends with them. You were, you were uh, associated, who you associated with. And I do understand the power of association and the effects it can have today. But when Jesus, that's why they got so mad when Jesus would go, go to somebody's house like Zacchaeus. Or he would spend time with a, with a prostitute. Or he would spend time with people, tax collectors. And people were like, man, what, who's this guy? Who's he think he is spending time with them? He was going there. He was going to be with them there together because he knew that his effect on their life was more powerful than if he wasn't there, obviously. But if he was just there, how many know his presence changed everything? It doesn't say that he said a thing to Zacchaeus. It just says he said, I'm coming to your house. And he comes to his house, and all of a sudden Zacchaeus changes. He repents. He pays back with interest people that he stole money from. He changed immediately. How many know the season changed because Jesus said, I'm coming to your house? Anybody else's wife clean the house when somebody's coming? <laughs> the women are going to be mad at me today. See, in Jesus' day, when you went to someone's house, it meant something. There wasn't all this communication like we have today, where you can reach or talk to someone in seconds. Something happens, and in seconds, it can be around the world. In seconds, everybody knows it. In seconds, it goes viral. It, it just, it's crazy, the communication that we have today, but yet people are still starving for real relationship together. I remember when I was growing up, I was a teenager, and we worked for this bigger farm. Dad was the manager for this uh, bigger ranch, and, and so we were able to work during the summers, brush hogging, building fence, and hauling hay, doing whatever um, for this, and we would go down to where the, 
one of the guys, there was two brothers, one of them owned a store, and we would go to the store to get our checks. And one day we went there to get our checks, and this guy was telling us about it. He said, they, he said somebody was talking about this new technology that's coming out. Now, mind you, I was 14. That was like 12 years ago. And they were talking about this new technology that was coming out. And he said, um, they're actually talking about making a phone or that someday there'll be a phone where you can actually see the person that you're talking to. And we all busted out laughing. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. We said, why would you want to look at somebody when you're talking to them? Think about it. There wasn't that option back then. The communication, the texting, the talking, the, the, all that stuff wasn't there. So we had no need for that because we were getting it every day because we spent time with people. We saw people face to face. If we talked to people face to face, we talked to them face to face. But today we have come so far with our technology and all this communication stuff. Now people are wanting to see who they're talking to so bad. They want that connection. They want to be there with them because they are not spending time with somebody anyway. So, even, so whatever time I get, I want to be able to see you at the same time. I don't know if that's making sense to you or not, but I just see how it has changed so much. We have had all this stuff we thought we wanted, but yet the thing we're truly craving is the together, is the, to be with them is to be able to see them and touch them if we could. And I, I get the, the other sides of that. I'm not trying to be just an old fuddy dud with it. We have a generation today coming up that, that and, and I don't mean this derogatory, they, but they can't dial a rotary phone. I love some, watching some of those videos. Not that they ever need to again, but it's hilarious because to us it was second nature. But they're like, how does that work? If it doesn't just have a touch something, they, it's like they can't figure it out. Who won't even know what it's like to call grandma and grandpa without seeing them at the same time. Guilty as charged. When I get to talk to my grandkids, I want to see them. Why? Because I don't get to see them as much as I'd like to. Do you see how simple that is? I'm not asking to come over more often, Jess, but... But we want to see them because it's our nature. We want to be together. But the more technology improves and the more things develop, the closer we get to being live. We want live. We want live video. We want live relationships. We want everything live. We want every ball game live. We're watching the, the NFR, the rodeo, live. It's live right now. You can see it when it happens. You can be there. You can be there when it happens. People really want to be together. We've been so disconnected that we really want is just not just to talk to people, but to see them and be with them. It's almost like... They're with us when you have it live. It's almost like it's, you're together. He said, I'm going to prepare a place that where I am, you may be also. If you'll just go with me a little bit this morning. Jesus went to heaven. How many know he's seated at the right hand of the Father? And he said, I am going to prepare a place, but I don't think he's going to build mansions. I don't think that you can't find that in the Bible. We made that up in songs. Otherwise, Jesus is one building dude. Because I've built houses and done things by myself before. It takes a long time. You say, well, he's got angels. I don't know about that. I don't think he's concerned about the house we're going to live in there as much as he wants us to be there with him. Amen. But how many know the heavens are a spiritual place? It's a spiritual realm. Jesus said, I'm going to the spiritual realm to prepare a place where you and I can be together because I can't be with everybody when I'm here on earth. But if we'll get into the spirit realm, I can be with you at all times. I'm going to prepare a place that where I am, you may be also. It's not an accident that we all want relationship. A relationship beyond <coughs> just text, just our Bible, just our scripture. We want that communication with God. We want His presence with us. We want to hear His voice speak to us. We want to see Him moving and changing and affecting situations. We want to be connected with Him. It's not the same as being there with them. Jesus was with some. Uh, was some there was another story uh, of the little girl. I've told this before, probably the little girl that was afraid to go to sleep one night and she yelled in the other room to her daddy, and she said, Daddy, I'm scared. And he said, It's okay, Jesus is with you. Just pray. You'll be okay. 
a little bit. She said, Daddy, I'm still scared. It's okay, Jesus is with you. Third time she said, Daddy, I'm still scared. He said, it's okay, Jesus is with you. She said, I know Jesus is with me, Daddy, but right now I'd like Jesus with some skin on. You are the Jesus with skin on to somebody else in your world. Amen? You and I, it's Him through us by His Spirit that flows through us. We are connected to Him by His Spirit. It is in the spirit realm that God does everything and then it manifests into the physical realm. When God spoke, how many know nothing was in existence? He spoke into the word actually means chaos in the very beginning. It was chaos. There was nothing. He spoke into nothing and created everything. When we get into the spirit realm, when we begin to ask God to flow through us and to speak through us and to live in the spirit, the Bible says in the New Testament, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That means there is a place that we can live and, and have our being. There is a, an understanding that we can live by and with that will affect our natural physical world, but it is by His Spirit. We're entering a season where we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the Savior of the world, the season when what it used to be about is remembering the time when divinity stepped out of eternity and into humanity and became the reality of not just a Savior that was coming someday, but now, now, now is with us. We celebrate the time in the literal physical sense when Jesus came to the earth and became flesh and dwelt among us. Your Bible says in Matthew, can we pull up Matthew? <clears throat> now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make a public, her a public example, was minded or thought about putting her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, everybody say, saying, God spoke, season change. God spoke saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. This is a picture, this is a type of what God wants to do through the church, through you and I today. By His Spirit, He conceives within us ideas, plans, visions, abilities, talents, and giftings. He conceives those in us as the bride of Christ, and so we can produce into the earth. And, she's, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken before by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. He's here now. That's what Christmas is about. We celebrate Emmanuel. God is with us. We celebrate the time that Jesus came and was with us. How many know he was only here for 33 and a half years and then he was gone? Where is he now? The season they had waited on and heard about for hundreds of years. The time or season where he's no longer coming someday, but he is now here together. They heard of what Jesus, would, the, the Savior was coming, this Messiah was coming, and now at that particular time, it happened. It came to pass. He was birthed into the physical realm. He was here in the flesh with some skin on. I don't know about you. I don't know any other way to describe it. Did you have, uh, get that video? I want to show you just a short clip. I don't know how to describe the feeling that I felt when the Lord was speaking to me about this. Is, is the anticipation... And this is the best I can come up with on short notice. The anticipation of what it would be like to know that daddy was coming home. That he was coming to us. That he was going to be there. I'm going to try to get you in the fields just a little bit this morning with this video. Watch this.
Turn it up. Oh, oh, oh. Wait a minute, he's not on the dumb team. Just returning from South Korea, Black Hawk Helicopter Crew Chief, Private First Class Brandon Covey. See, we don't know what it was like to live under 400 years of oppression. We don't know what it's like to be of generations of never having God speak or never God, being, or God never being around. We don't know what it's like to live in that time and season when the God that actually we've heard all these stories about was going to come actually here and dwell with us. I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to stop you. Did you delete it? I'll stop talking. This is us fighting against God. You know that season's about to change. God speaks, seasons change. Even his friends gathered around him when his dad came in. That's how we ought to be in church when God speaks to one of us. The rest of us ought to get that excited because God spoke, the Father spoke to them and said, I'm here, something's about to change because I'm speaking. That's enough, if you would, Taylor. I'm going to try to finish up real quick. The season they had waited on and heard about for hundreds of years. The time where he's no longer coming, but he is now here with us together. These parents were off somewhere protecting the whole nation and providing for their families at the same time for a season, but now they are home together because the ultimate of any relationship is to be together. I've never heard somebody laying on their deathbed and saying, I wish I'd have spent more time at work. I wish I'd have made more money. I wish I'd have spent more time away from my family. Every single one that you will ever hear, if you have the privilege of being with people when they are dying, they will say the same thing almost every single time. I wished I had more time together. I wished I had more time together. And I feel like God is saying the church is dying because we're so worried about entertaining and all this other stuff and we're not spending time together with Him. We're not allowing Him time to spend with us. He is saying, I am here. He came here. He was Emmanuel, God with us back then. And then there's the bedroom. 
in a house, the place of rest, the place to recuperate. I don't have time to do this whole thing justice of the rooms in us and the places in our life, the place of rest, the place to recuperate, the place to rejuvenate. The place to regain strength. That's what a bedroom is for. It's a room of intimacy. It's the time of rest or the season of rest when we are with God and we are just spending time with Him and the rest with Him in our life. And that's where ideas and visions are birthed and dreams and things that He wants to produce in and through us happen. It's that place of rest, not the place of busyness, not the place of doing all this stuff. It is that place of rest where you hear Him speak and the intimacy really happens. It's during the worship services that we have here at church. This is not entertainment. This is not about anything, but it's just a time to shut out everything and come together and just worship God and spend time together and have Him speak to us. Be in His presence. Just certain people go in that room because that's personal. It's just for me. Me and my spouse only. It's just for me and me and God. What happens in the spirit world between me and God, what happens in that place is for us only. It will affect others later, but it's mainly about a relationship. What goes on is here is important in all kinds of ways. Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 24. Can I have that back? When you leave the entry or the foyer of your house, the greeting place, and go into another room, everything is different, right? I'm getting to this. Stay with me. Because what... That first room was what it was for and what it had purpose. But when you leave that room and you leave that season and you go into the next room, the purpose of the last room has nothing to do with the purpose of this room. What I hear the Lord saying to this church is, I want you to understand, I want to take you from one room to the next. I want to take you from one type of relationship with me to the next. I want you to know that I don't want to just leave you in the entryway. I don't want you just welcomed into my house. I don't want you to know I'm just here. I don't want, I don't want to just, I want to take you further. God is wanting to take this church further. I feel this so strong. The place, the purpose you were before has nothing to do with it. If you're going to go into the next dimension of your life, say in business or anything else, you have to leave that other stuff behind. When you go to a new level, a new place, you've got to think different. You've got to talk different. If you're going to go to a professional level, you've got to get on a professional level. Amen? We can sit around and watch pro football players, pro rodeo people, pro whatever you want to do, pro preachers and talk about, boy, I'd love to be there. But how many know you're never going to be there until you step out of where you are? You're never going to go to that next place until you leave the last place. It's, it's, a, it's a struggle. People don't want to change. We, get, we want to be in this one season. And if the season's okay, like we talked about uh, uh, last week or the week before about the, the wilderness, it's okay. God's kind of here and He kind of provides our needs and it's just enough to get by. But God's screaming at this church right now, I'm telling you, I want to go further. I want to meet more than just your needs Basically, I want to take you. I want to affect the town. I want to affect the nation. I want you to affect your generations. He wants to take us further. God sent me here to tell some of you today that this season of the year, you need to be reminded that every season is not the same. And there's a reason for it. Whatever happened in the last season, Jessica got all over this in the beginning, whatever happened in the last season of your life is not what's going to happen in the next It may have been good or bad, but that has nothing to do with the next season other than it served its purpose. Because my Bible still says the same thing. Your Bible still says all things work together for good of those that love God and are called according to His purpose. Amen? It may have been good or bad, but it has nothing to do with what's happening next. When you left that last season, it was no different than leaving one room and going to the next. The only thing you and I need to know is what room are we in, God? Where am I at? What do you want to do? Where do you want to take me now? At what place in this walk am I with you? At what room do you want to spend time with me together? I know what the last one felt like. I know what went on in the other room. But God, I'm not sure what's going on in this one. I just walked in. Help me know what room I'm in. Help me know what season I'm in. Help me know what's fixing to go on here. 
I was thinking about this and the Lord spoke to me and said, I am the one who made the seasons both natural and spiritual. And not only that, but I prepared them. Just like when I said, go in to prepare a place for you that, and you and I can dwell together. And if I do, I will surely come again and receive you unto myself. The word I have for you today in this season is changing. But don't worry. God is going to be there in the next season because he has prepared it. God is going to be there in the next season for this church. He's going to be there in the next season for all of you. Why? Because he has prepared a place, a season, a time where you and him can dwell together. It's not going to be in the flesh anymore, but it's going to be in the spirit realm. It's the place or season God is wanting to take his people to or remind them of in the spirit. It's the season to celebrate the Lord, the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. His birth into this world in the natural, in the flesh. But I'm here to remind you today, church, that He is here. He is Emmanuel, all right. He is God with us. He prepared a place, and it is in the Spirit where He and we can dwell together. Emmanuel, God with us. I don't care what you're going through this morning. You can access the Father anytime. I don't care what situation you're in. He's always here. He is the one that said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. It's hard when you have had an earthly father that has left you or forsook you or you were never good enough for or you may have been abused or whatever the situation is. But I'm here to tell you today, your spiritual father is not that way. He is a God that said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Amen. He will be with you. He promised he would never leave us or forsake us. I don't know of a better greeting for a season than that, than knowing he's with us. Knowing he's with us. Amen? Stand with me if you would. I don't mean to be, you shut that off. <laughs>